We are now ready to delve into the book in chapter two, and we are going to start with the concept of triangularization. And I suspect since we covered triangular matrices before, you have a pretty good idea of where this is headed, and you're right. We're going to take an arbitrary matrix, and we're going to try to put it into upper triangular form. And we're going to use the tools you're used to. In other words, we're going to use row reduction, or now maybe we'll call it Gaussian elimination. So let's get started at that, and we'll even use an example to make this a bit easier. We're going to introduce this new concept called pivoting. Pivoting is going to be the action of doing row reduction, but we're going to keep track of the column and rows that we are doing the operations on. Uh, we may even call something a pivot cell when we're focusing on the cell of operation. But if we go back now and we remind ourselves of what we would normally do, we would say, well, let's go put this thing into echelon form. How do we do that? Well, we try to get a one in the upper left-hand corner and put zeros all below it. Then we move or pivot down to the next position, which will be the A22 position, and we'll try to get a one there and zeros below. And we'll get a one in the A33 position with a zero below that, and finally a one in the A44 position, keeping track, of course, of what happens to the B vector in its augmented spot. Now we're going to do something like that, but we'll, we'll do something even a little simpler. Well, first of all, we are not going to require that we put ones down the diagonal like we did with echelon form. We're still going to go for those zeros below the main diagonal. Um, but as far as what's in the main diagonal, we'll just let it fall where it will. When we get to what looks almost like echelon form without the ones in the diagonal, we will do a check to see if we're singular or non-singular. And if we are non-singular, we will solve the system without doing the reduced echelon form. Instead, we're going to use something called back substitution. So let's go ahead and give it a try with an example. And if we look now at how we would get rid of the 12 without necessarily putting a 1 in the upper left-hand corner, if you were doing row reduction, you would say, well, I'll take minus 2 times row 1 and add it to row uh, 2. And that would be the right thing to do. So let's go after that. But we will also keep track of exactly how we did it using formulas that are a little more detailed than we used last time. The reason why we took minus 2 times row 1 and added it to row 2 is because the ratio between the A21 position and the A11 position was 2. So we needed to subtract off that proportion of row 1 in order to get a 0 in that position. So if we write down exactly what we did, we took row 2 minus A21 over A11 times row 1, and we did that operation. Now that turned out to be 12 over 6 for the, the factor or our multiplier, and that's where we got the R2 minus 2 R1. But right now I'm more interested in the fact that we used A21 over A11 because we're going to create an algorithm that takes advantage of those cells. All right, let's move on to the next step, which would be how can we code this first using pseudocode and then later using MATLAB? Well, this was the operating formula that we used. We took A21, and we subtracted off A21 divided by A11 times A11, and that is going to force the result to be zero. Now let's examine this structure of this pseudocode a little more closely. Uh, first of all, it, this has no choice but to be zero. I mean, look, if we take A11 and cancel it with that A11, we're certainly taking A21 minus A21. How else can that be anything other than zero? So you're guaranteed to get a zero in that position. This arrow here, this left arrow, means assigned to, and these are the steps that the computer is going to go through. It's going to go to A21 and not find a number, it's going to find an address. The address will be a location in memory. 
And if this is single point precision, just for argument's sake, it will pull off the four bytes immediately following the address stored in A21. It'll convert those four bytes to floating point real, and it'll do the same thing with all of these other addresses and perform the arithmetic using floating point. After that arithmetic is done, it is going to assign the value to the memory location found on the left. A21 is the same memory location that we used before. That means that whatever value was there originally is going to get clobbered, literally clobbered, overwritten, if you will, with the values that are, that are constructed here. Now, in this particular formula, every time you're going to get a zero, which means you're going to get a zero stuffed into that. Uh, into those four bytes in floating point notation. Now that's not enough because we need to do every element in row two. So we need pseudocode for the other three elements in that row. This time we want to take the A22 value and subtract off the same multiplier. We want to subtract off the two, the value two again, which was constructed by taking the ratio of those two areas in memory. But this time, use that multiplier uh, and multiply it by A12, because that's the appropriate column location for that operation. And again, take the result after it's been constructed in floating point and assign it to, or clobber, those four bytes that are found at the address stored in A22. I'm using a lot of words, but I'm using them carefully because I want you to realize the computer works with addresses, it finds out where the data is, it pulls it out, it converts it to floating point, just like we talked about in chapter one, and then it stuffs the results back into that memory location. And of course, we need to do the same thing for the other uh, th for, the, for the third and fourth column positions. Oh, and don't forget, we got to do it for B also. That exact same transformation has to be made uh, for vector B as well. Now that looks good. It looks a little bit, uh, you know, not very interesting and maybe a little bit tedious, but there's problems with it. Uh, it's not only not very imaginative coding, it actually wouldn't work. Now I've taken you all through that and I'm telling you that it isn't going to work. Well, it almost would work, but I've made a very crucial mistake that I want you to note. And that is, after I make this first computation and I store the results in A21, that value is now zero. When I perform my second operation, it goes back out into memory again, and it's going to find what? Well, it's going to find a zero because I already calculated a zero there, which means this whole operation isn't going to do a thing, and A22 will remain unchanged. A22 will be retrieved, nothing's going to happen because we're going to subtract off a zero, and that value then is going to get stuffed back into A22 again. So a lot of work for nothing. Same thing's going to happen to A23 and A24, and the same thing's going to happen to B2. So if you run this code and you go back and take a look to see what happened, you're going to be really confused, and you'll stare at the algorithm, and you said, I got it right out of the book, and I don't understand why it doesn't work. It makes sense. Well, the timing and sequence of calculations matters in all algorithms that we will be working on. So we have to be careful what and when a calculation was made. So we made a subtle error here that is going to really give us trouble. So how could we fix that? Well, we can fix both the tedium and we can fix the calculation error by doing a for loop and doing an extra calculation that actually saves us arithmetic. Uh, first of all, I am going to pre-multiply this A21 over A11 as my, my desired factor and save it now in a new variable called mult. Now, on the side here, I am really sensitive about efficiency. If you write code that has more floating point operations than you need, you're going to lose some credit for that. Or if you make mistakes, you're going to lose credit for that. Or if you use too much storage, I'm not going to like that either. And in this case, we have now allocated a new variable uh, that is stored at the address 
uh, found in malt. And so I've, I have used up four new bytes. Well, have I saved anything? Well, I've saved calculations. And of course, I'm going to end up doing it right instead of wrong like before. If I back up one slide for just a moment, and I look at this, you can count that each one of these lines is producing one, two, three. There's an implied time sign here. One, two, three calculations. And we have five such lines, which means we have 15 floating point operations that we're doing. And in this method, we have only two operations for each item in the loop. Uh, so let's take a look at that loop. What the for loop is doing is just what you expect from your MATLAB class. It is allowing J to increment from 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, every single value until you get to the ending value N, which would have been defined somewhere else in the code. So in our case, we have N equal to 4. It's the number of rows. And we have two operations, two floating point operations for each one of those. So that makes 8. Uh, don't forget, this guy is going to make a ninth operation, and we'll have, uh, we'll have two more here, 10 and 11, uh, for the B vector. So we come out with fewer floating point operations, which means our computer code runs faster. In addition to that, we're going to do it right, because MALT now is calculated once initially to be the correct factor. In our case, it was the number 2. Once I've done that, since I'm not going to clobber malt anymore, this loop will use the right value as the multiplier for the correct, for the correct column positions. And the same with B. We're doing the same operation. So we do have to be careful on use of memory. Use it carefully, but use it so you get the right answer. That's a good thing to do. And use it in a way that minimizes computations and hopefully memory allocation as well. Okay, so let's continue this. We, we're not done because we needed to uh, do the same thing in row three. The previous set of code only puts a zero in row two and does the appropriate remaining Gaussian uh, manipulations for the rest of that row. But we have to do row three as well. Now row three is going to require a different multiplier. The ratio so it should be a31 over a11 in order to get a zero in that leading uh, column. But the form of the calculation is exactly the same. We're just allowing the third row to be manipulated that we did with the second. And again, the B is the same thing. And of course, row four is going to look exactly the same. Okay, so that all sounds really good, uh, except as I look at it again, it seems like I'm going to have to continue to come up with new pseudocode for every new row I produce. And if this is a hundred or a thousand line matrix, then I've got an awful lot of pseudocode. And what's worse is I have to customize my pseudocode depending on the size of the matrix, and that's not so good either. Well, we can solve that problem fairly easily as well by adding what we call a nested loop. We're putting in the index i as a stand-in variable uh, to keep track of our row number. But the logic of these lines here, these inner lines, is exactly the same as we had on the previous page. Therefore, i is going to go from 2 to the last row. Well, why not 1? Well, 1, row 1, we're leaving alone because we're only trying to put zeros in rows 2 through n. So as we allow i to increment, we also must put i in the appropriate positions where the fixed number used to be, and also in the, the b vector as well. So that then gives us a nice algorithm to put zeros all the way down the first column. Okay, that's not really enough because that won't triangularize the matrix entirely, but it gets us off to a good start. We now need to repeat that process for column two, column three, and column four, but each time we do it, the pivot cell is going to drop down. I mean, it's going to be coming down the main diagonal as we are trying to reduce a smaller and smaller number of rows using the Gaussian reduction. Uh, we can fix that next time as we take a look at the uh, completion of this algorithm.